You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host for BioTalk. And as you know, we interview leaders within the biohealth capital region who have an impact on growing our economy. And today, we're very proud to have someone from the Baltimore area that's handling economic development for a much broader region in that area. And it's Michelle Whaley, who is the president and CEO of the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore. Michelle, welcome to BioTalk. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to have you on the show, and it's great to have Baltimore represented because as you know, with the biohealth capital region, it's an integral and a critical part to what we're trying to do to build and make this a more vibrant ecosystem. So for our listeners, a lot of them probably don't know you, Michelle, even though you're well known within the region. Why don't you give a little bit of your background to our listeners about how you got into this field and ended up at EAGB? Terrific, Rich. And you all will quickly figure out how old I am with this background. I actually started in economic development in Baltimore City in the early 90s. I had practiced law for a very short period of time and then went into real estate development and then gravitated to economic development in Baltimore City. Although I'm not a Baltimore City native, and as anybody who knows Baltimore, if you don't go to high school in Baltimore, you're never going to be considered a native. Or a prep school. (laughs) I grew up in Montgomery County, actually. But in any event, I worked for eight years with the city's nonprofit economic development corporation, Baltimore Development Corporation, and stayed very much involved in city economic development, going into private consulting after leaving BDC. My major client for about a year and a half was Johns Hopkins Medicine. This was before the Johns Hopkins Biopark was even developed. And then I took over the Downtown Partnership Organization. And from that point in time, which was 2000, really to the present, I went in and out of consulting, again, focused significantly on working with Baltimore City organizations, for-profit and not-for-profit. I spent two years under contract with Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. Yale wanted and helped fund a BDC-type, arm's-length economic development corporation for the city of New Haven. So I had a two-year contract, was in New Haven for two years came back to run a regional transportation organization. And the region was quite large. It was central Maryland, and it was essentially from Frederick through Montgomery, Prince George's, Anne Arundel County, up to Hartford County. Really looking at transportation as a very important ingredient for economic development. Went back into consulting for about four years, and then I was given the opportunity in January 2019, so a little more than a year and a half now, to take on the Economic Alliance of Baltimore with my partner in crime, Chief Operating Officer Sharon Markley Schreiber. Sharon and I had worked together in the past. We were brought on board to really get EAGB focused on what its core mission has always been since its inception. So that's how I came to EAGB. Well, great history and great background and a really good asset for the region based on the history you've had. And then next thing would be, we talk about the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore, and some people in your region will definitely know who you are, but there are other people, since we broadcast through all of Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, I think it would be good for the listeners to know more about what EAGB is, how it was created, and how it's evolved to where it is today. The organization, which will surprise a lot of people, is 23 years old. It was created in the late 1990s. The impetus was some of the elected officials, but primarily Congressman Dutch Rupersberger, who at the time was county executive for Baltimore County, was born and raised in Baltimore City, cared and cares deeply about the city. And Congressman Rupersberger got together with some of the top CEOs in the region at the time. And this is when there were significant corporate headquarters in Baltimore. And they felt very strongly that the health of the city was very much tied to the surrounding counties. And importantly, as were the health of the counties tied to the health of the city. 
and that it was only through collaborating on economic development marketing as a region, as opposed to everybody else and themselves. It was only by pulling everybody together to market the assets and opportunities in the region would the health of the region's economy be elevated, particularly that of the city. So it was chartered in 1997 with the senior most elected official in the city and five surrounding counties, chartered members of the board, voting members of the board. So it was Baltimore City and Carroll County, Hartford County, Baltimore County, Howard County, and Anne Arundel County. With the county executives, again, a voting member of the board and Carroll County, which has a commissioner form of government, the commissioner. In 2007, Cecil County asked to be included in the organization. That came out of, if you recall, 2007, it was the BRAC initiative that Maryland benefited significantly from. And Cecil County was in that mix because of their proximity to Aberdeen, but also to their proximity to Delaware. So since 2007, Cecil County has also been part of the region. Because we have elected officials as voting members of our board, we are not a lobbying organization. We're also not a membership organization. Our board members, including the local governments and about 40 private sector industry leaders and academia, are investors in the organization. And by that, I mean they literally write a check every year to support the activities of the organization. So that's the history. So we've been around a long time. 23 years, and that's a great compliment for an economic development organization. And I'm sure there have been changes as you have evolved over 23 years. And you have different players involved that are engaged in supporting EAGB today, as you mentioned from the beginning. So talk about this interaction you have with sort of a private-public partnership. And that's really the public, academia, industry, all trying to work together and coming up with a common goal and a mission for the organization. That interaction is unique, and it's also critical to the success of the organization, but the success of the region, which is why we even exist. So at board meetings, our private sector industry leaders hear directly from the county executives, the commissioner of Carroll County, who report out at every board meeting about challenges, issues, good news, et cetera, et cetera. And you can imagine how important that's been with the pandemic over the last couple of months. We have had a seat on the board for the chancellor of the University System of Maryland, Rick Kerwin was a very active member of the board, as was Bob Corrett, and Dr. Jay Perman has been also actively participating in Economic Alliance's activities. We have also have Towson University with Dr. Kim Schatzel, Kathy Getz, who is the Dean of Business School at Loyola, and Howard County Community College. So academia is very important to the success of the organization, but the success of the region in their interaction with both the elected officials and private sector industry. Outside of board meetings, we also collaborate extensively with the chief economic development officers in each of our jurisdictions. We meet monthly with them. They review our collateral material, our website, our industry profiles, et cetera, et cetera. They provide input into what our focus should be. This was critically important when Sharon and I started back in January 2019. So that interaction has been very robust. And again, without that interaction, we would not be able to be as focused as we are in the needs of the region. It shows how important collaboration is with all of your partners, but it's very difficult sometimes to find that common mission to work on. And I think what you're trying to do is elevate Baltimore City and the whole region as a good place to do business. So I guess the key would be, and we're speaking with Michelle Whaley, who's president and CEO of the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore. Michelle, let's talk a little bit about your current priorities and goals for the organization. Well, when we started in January, 2019, in addition to meeting with all the county executives and the mayor and with the economic development officers, also met with our other board members one-on-one to find out, number one, why they were investing in the Economic Alliance, what were their expectations, what were their concerns, but particularly the input of the elected officials and the economic development partners, we quickly heard that we weren't focused enough 
in terms of our industry focus, and we weren't pulling the region together under those priorities based on industry sectors. So we began to develop our marketing program, again, with a lot of input from our economic development partners, focused on key industry sectors. And no surprise to anybody who knows the the Baltimore, Washington area, certainly healthcare and life sciences. The cybersecurity, hugely important in greater Baltimore, were bookended by both Aberdeen Proving Grounds and Fort Meade. So cyber, hugely important. Fort Meade being the headquarters of the U.S. Cyber Command and, of course, NSA, among other organizations. So cybersecurity, IT in general, not just cyber-focused, given the increasing importance of technology across any industry sector, frankly. And then two that are more unique to Greater Baltimore than to the capital region, and that's logistics and manufacturing. Logistics, we have the Port of Baltimore, which is one of the top performing ports in the country. It's one of the four ports on the eastern seaboard that have the depth for the Panamax ships coming through the Panama Canal now, as well as a great highway and rail network that enables logistics companies in the Baltimore area to reach a third of the country via rail or truck within a day and a half. It's very critically located. The logistics is a vitally important industry sector for greater Baltimore. And then in manufacturing, and of course, I think we all hear over and over again, manufacturing is dead in the United States. Well, it's not. It's not easy, but it certainly is an important industry. We have manufacturing facilities that are expanding in Cecil County, in Carroll County, in Baltimore County, Hartford County. And some of the growth is due to the interaction between logistics and manufacturing, but also due to the fact that manufacturing is increasingly based on technology. I've listened to presentations from companies like Stanley Black and Decker, who are using artificial intelligence and big data to drive everything from how they design tools, to produce them, to distributing them. So the region's richness in producing technology talent really supports the unique growth of manufacturing. And frankly, in a state that isn't particularly favorable in terms of its energy cost or its tax structure for manufacturing. So those are the industry sectors that we have focused on our whole entire marketing platform. And within those are several very important, what we call subsectors. Digital health is one that is very important, again, because the technology foundation required for just about anything anymore. The military, I mentioned already Aberdeen Proving Ground and Fort Meade. The defense industry is a huge driver in the region for the capital region as well, but significantly for greater Baltimore. And higher ed, we are so privileged to have top-ranked academic institutions in the greater Baltimore region, led significantly, of course, by Johns Hopkins and by the University of Maryland. So that's our focus. And the other one that we do have a focus on, and I'll mention it just very briefly, is agriculture. Again, very important for some of our northern counties, Cecil, Carroll, and Hartford counties, but it's equally important for Howard and Baltimore counties with family-owned farms. So our marketing platform really is based on those industry sectors. We have a terrific data researcher, uh, data analyst on board as one of our staff, Nick Henninger. We have undertaken creating industry profiles for all the major categories and now creating industry profiles for the subcategories which are living, breathing documents. We produce them in-house. They're on our website. They can be easily changed given the changing nature of economic development. And again, all created with a lot of feedback and input from our economic development partners. Well, thanks. Very broad mandate, but it focuses on what the strengths and the assets are that you have within your region. And so let's talk a little bit about sort of what is the current state of the economic development and the economy in the region? And let's talk about it in two ways. One is, how was it before COVID-19? And then what is the implications that COVID-19's had on the economy within EAGB's scope? Pre-pandemic, we were continuing to see significant growth in logistics, again, driven by the port business. The Port of Baltimore is number one in the country for roll-on, roll-off business, which are cars, trucks, and equipment that are coming from offshore. Again, manufacturing because of the location along the East Coast. Growth in 
healthcare, including the research supporting life sciences, and cyber, cyber becoming increasingly important as ransomware attacks, hacking, the threat from offshore in terms of the integrity of our data systems, and the fact that even with very traditional industries like logistics and manufacturing, any company that has data has a cyber issue. And driving that home has been one of our important mandates at the Economic Alliance. So I'd say across all industry sectors, there's been growth, significantly more, of course, in healthcare life sciences, cyber and IT, and logistics than in manufacturing, but seeing growth there as well. Then March 2020, <laughs> and the world shut down. Sure. We had just started in early February. Most of 2019, our marketing platform was very focused within the region, getting the region to understand its own assets. And I'm sure as an economic development professional, you understand how difficult that is sometimes, that what happens in Cecil and Carroll County benefits what's happening in Anne Arundel and Howard counties. So we spent a great deal of time in our marketing efforts we're really focused internally in the region. But starting in 2020, we began a very targeted, digitally-based marketing effort focused on out of region. And we started in early February targeting Philadelphia and Boston on life sciences. And our goal was to interest talent that's in those locations that there are opportunities in greater Baltimore because of our wealth of life science work in the region. Those ads ran for about four weeks. And once the pandemic became a real concern, before it basically turned the world upside down, we did two weeks of vaccine-related ads, again in Philadelphia and Boston. And we had planned over the year 2020 to then roll out, again, very targeted ads on cybersecurity, on logistics, on manufacturing. Well, we've put that on hold. When people aren't working in their offices, it's very hard to use a Google geofencing platform for your Google ads. And frankly, people were hunkered down because of the pandemic. So that's been a big impact on how we approach marketing. But in terms of how the region is faring, no surprise, the jurisdictions, particularly Baltimore City, that have significant tourism and hospitality industries have been just devastated. The cancellation of conventions, hotel occupancy just plummeting, closing all the attractions. And this is the case also in the counties, and the region is very rich in museums and historic locations, and all of that shut down. And then, of course, the impact with small businesses. And this is certainly not unique to greater Baltimore. It's been felt everywhere, including D.C. in the capital region. Our small businesses not only produce a great deal of jobs, but they're vital for what we call an economic development, keeping feet on the street. Those storefronts along streets that provide the energy that support housing and urban centers as well as our amenities for office workers. Well, there's nobody working in their offices, so there's nobody going, even if the restaurants were open, there's nobody going. So it really has been a challenge. In fact, our EDOs, I mentioned earlier, meet monthly, but starting in early April, at their request, we started doing, and this is all virtual now, of course, doing bi-weekly virtual calls because they really wanted to talk to each other, certainly about the challenges, but also what they were doing. How is Baltimore County handling providing funding through the CARES Act, for example, to small businesses? The Downtown Partnership is part of this group. Shalonda Stokes is the CEO. What were they doing in an urban center that's vital to the entire region? So that has gone back to once a month, but it was a really important interaction that our EDOs were focused on. So while the world is still somewhat, or not the world, the region, but the country is still somewhat Let's say not fully operational, let's put it that way. Let's say on hold a little bit. It's on hold. So we've been searching for other opportunities to bring attention to the greater Baltimore region's assets. And that led me to you, actually, earlier this spring, because we know how important biohealth and life sciences to the greater Baltimore region, but the entire region. And frankly, with the spotlight now on vaccine development, the eyes and ears are on what's happening in the region. Johns Hopkins University of Maryland, 
Emergent Bio Solutions, a number of companies, Moderna with their partnership with some of the companies on 270 Quarter. It's incredibly important. So we've been looking at opportunities to sponsor and be involved in virtual events where we can say, hey, this is what's happening in greater Baltimore in biohealth and life sciences. And we're looking also at opportunities to do the same with logistics, cyber, and manufacturing. And hopefully as we progress into the fall, that's how we'll approach our out-of-region marketing. There's been an impact, let's put it that way. We're hoping that if not sooner, that by the first of the year, a lot of the restrictions, again, depending on vaccine development and treatment, are lifted and we can go back to the format that we had developed back in January of 2020. The other vehicle that we're using to, again, highlight the fact that in spite of the pandemic, and frankly, in spite of negative perception about Baltimore, uh, we started at the end of 2019 a quarterly investment report. And the investment report was, was produced quarterly. The first two quarters of 2020 exceeded the first two quarters of 2019. And interestingly enough, Baltimore City was the lead jurisdiction in attracting capital investment to start up and emerging companies. So that's a vehicle that's become very important for us to push out because it says, hey, we're still growing. We're still attracting investment. We still have industry sectors that are vital to the nation, to the region, et cetera. That's been something that we've developed that has become increasingly important to draw positive attention because we are the greater Baltimore region and we are in the Baltimore MSA. Baltimore MSA is basically the same jurisdictions as the Economic Alliance, except for Cecil County. And that's a federal designation. It's not going to change. So the identity of the region is very tied to the identity of Baltimore. So again, going back to the original purpose of forming a regional economic development marketing organization was to make sure that we were all working to lift each other up. And that's continuing. One of the things that I'm pleased about is you're reaching out a couple months ago to Biohealth Innovation and me, because we used to have a robust relationship with the AGB when I first created Biohealth Innovation. And when you talk about some of the unique attributes of the region, I'm not from the region. So when I first came there, everybody would say, where'd you go to school? And I thought, <laughs> where I went to college. You know, it's what high school or prep school did you go to? Oh, it's not in Baltimore. <laughs> So that was one thing I found out. The second thing I found out was our office is in Rockville, and we had a satellite office at EAGB, actually in Baltimore, in the earlier days. But what I found out was Montgomery County and Baltimore looked at each other as two distinct marketing areas. And Montgomery County sort of gravitated to D.C., Baltimore sort of had its own ecosystem. And everybody described it as the longest 35 miles in the world. <laughs> from Montgomery County to Baltimore, and it was hard for people to make that trip both ways. And so anyway, I think some of that's been broken down, but I want to ask you about what you think about, you have a challenge in a greater Baltimore region with six or seven counties, each having their own priorities, but then, and if you look at it on a macro basis, you really look at Frederick, you look at Montgomery County, Prince George's County, you look at Washington, D.C., you look at Northern Virginia, that makes up the bigger region from a collaboration standpoint for what we call the biohealth capital region, which Baltimore is a critical component to. So what do you see is the way that there's a potential for greater partnership and collaboration within these other regions who sometimes compete with one another, but are also interdependent on one another? It's a topic that's come up over and over again in the year and a half or so that I've been at the Economic Alliance, and it's one that I'm not unfamiliar with. As I said, I grew up in Montgomery County. Most of my family is actually still in the D.C. area. And though I didn't go to high school or prep school in Baltimore, my two kids went to a private school in Baltimore. So I guess by association, I'm almost a native. But yes, you're absolutely right. There's little collaboration, and there should be a significant opportunity for collaboration. The two areas certainly share industry sectors that are important growth industries for both the capital region and the Baltimore region. And I refer to it right now for the sake of this conversation as two regions, though I agree with you, it's really one region. And that is both 
the cyber IT sector and the biohealth sector, which of course is healthcare, life sciences, digital health increasingly. The research institutions that are in Baltimore, and with all due respect to excellent universities in the capital region, the 800 pound gorillas are in Baltimore, in the Baltimore region. And certainly both Johns Hopkins and the University System of Maryland have a presence at Shady Grove and elsewhere throughout the DC centric region. The pharmaceutical manufacturing industry that's along the 270 corridor is now very mature. It's what, 30 years, if not longer. You've got advantages there that don't exist, particularly in an urban setting like Baltimore City. Greenfields development, free parking, et cetera, et cetera. But there should be a collaboration, particularly with the research piece that's ongoing in the Baltimore area with the research component, but as well as the collaboration and the manufacturing component along the 270 corridor. To be truthful, I don't know how we get there other than starting these conversations, like the conversation you and I started several months ago. We've become active on the Association of University Research Parks. I've known Brian Darmody for quite a long time. I hope to reach out once the Labor Day holiday is over to the economic development folks in Prince George's County and Montgomery County, both of whom I know. But the nexus between the health of the entire capital region, or central Maryland, frankly, really needs to be strengthened with more collaboration. There's always going to be competition. There's going to be a company that's looking for a life science facility, and they're going to look in 270, and they're going to look in the Baltimore area, and that's going to be competition. And that's always going to be the case. But there are opportunities for greater collaboration. And then we also have industry sectors in greater Baltimore that strengthen the entire mega region that are not present in the capital region. And one in particular is logistics. We have the port, we have the rail and highway network, and that doesn't exist in the capital region. But does the growth of the logistics industry in greater Baltimore contribute to the mega region's economic health? Absolutely. As you said, we're only 35 miles apart. It's looking at the synergies with common industry sectors as well as the value added for unique industry sectors that I think needs to move forward. And the last piece is workforce. I spent three years going into D.C. when I was doing consulting before taking on the Economic Alliance, three days a week on the MARC train going to D.C. And when I would get on the train at Penn Station in Baltimore, it was near full from people coming from the north. And as we're going down the 95 corridor on the train, picking up more people at BWI, at Odenton, et cetera, et cetera. So the region, the workforce really needs to be looked at within the context of a mega region. And that really was driven home to me when I was running the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance. And we were lobbying to get more service on the MARC train. And I think, Rich, I met with every single chamber, and there are a lot of them between Frederick (laughs) and Harford County, and everybody supported additional service on the MARC train because of workforce. There's so many areas that are ripe for collaboration. People might appreciate the collaborative needs more now because of the pandemic, because we're more dependent on one another. And hopefully, discussions like you and I are having today and that we've had in the past will just further demonstrate the need for us to work more closely together. And so I think that I'm willing, you're willing, we can get a few other players together in a room. You mentioned Ben Wu, who's up in Montgomery County, you know, the people in Frederick, you know, the people over in Prince George's, but we can't be all things to all people. But one thing that's common with everybody right now, as you mentioned, is a couple industry sectors, which are vibrant in all of these communities. And we need more emergence, emergent with their corporate headquarters in Montgomery County and their manufacturing facility in Baltimore. Absolutely. That is a prime example of how industry can help break down these barriers because they want access to talent, they want access to good space, and also they need talent in both regions. So it was easy for them to expand their wings and build a facility in Baltimore. And I think we can get more people to understand the benefits of that co-location, taking advantage of the strengths of each of those areas, which makes their company stronger. 
that's critical. You mentioned immersion. There's also Catalan Bioservices, which purchased Paragon. They've got a couple hundred people at UMB Biopark. They're in Baltimore County at the BW Tech Park. And then, of course, they're expanding now in Montgomery County. And then you've got the Amazon headquarters coming into Northern Virginia. But Amazon's major distribution centers for the region are in the Baltimore region. And we also have two of our jurisdictions that are part of the Economic Alliance, Howard County and Arundel County, look as much to the D.C. region as they do to the Baltimore region. They may be part of the Baltimore MSA, but again, we're not talking about a region that's San Francisco to Los Angeles. As you said, it's 35 miles apart. (laughs) That's not that big. That's not that big. So basically, we talked about the great opportunities where we are today, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the future now in closing. Basically, you have an open mic right now, Michelle. What would you like to communicate to our BioTalk listeners about what you're doing with EAGB and what your plans for the future are? Oh, I think, as I mentioned before, we really need to figure out, we at the Economic Alliance, but also all of our partners, how to effectively send the message outside of the region that Here are amazing assets in the region, attracting talent. Everybody that we've talked to has said, get us the talent. The capital will follow and business relocations will follow. So while in past years, particularly in its early years, the AGB was very focused on business attraction, we're more focused on telling the story of Greater Baltimore in order to attract talent. That's something that, again, because of the pandemic, and frankly, even when life begins to approach normalcy, it's going to be a different normal. People say the new normal. I think that's really true. So how do we reach people and let them know you've got great opportunities in this region because of the assets within these industry sectors? And I think the other asset that we have that we at the Economic Mind need to market much more aggressively is quality of life. It is much less expensive to live in the Baltimore region than it certainly is in Boston or New York. And even so, frankly, in D.C. So we have those assets in the region that we can market as part of the package, as part of the story. As you know, it's not just about data. It's a story. So that's what I think our focus is going to be for the next four months or so of 2020, but moving into 2021. I want to pick up just briefly on your out-of-region marketing and this branding, because Up until about two years ago, everybody referred to the life science industry as the 270 corridor. And Genetic Engineering News puts together their top 10 biopharma clusters ranking in the country every year. And we started educating them on the biohealth capital region. When they did their rankings, they never included Baltimore and the statistics from Baltimore in this region. Now, we're including D.C., Baltimore, Frederick as part of the biohealth capital region, which they're referring to it to now. And as a result of that, we've grown from number six to number four. So you have Boston. That's great. I wasn't aware of that. San Francisco, New York, and the biohealth capital region, which is four. We bypass San Diego and Research Triangle. And That's really interesting. It's really educating people externally that we're part of a bigger ecosystem and that we are all trying to work together. And also that just happened with the JLL study, Jones Lang LaSalle Life Science Study. And last year we were fifth, now we're fourth. And they've started to incorporate a broader regional approach rather than just that old 270 corridor because, as we know, it's not just five miles in Montgomery County that makes up this region and this industry. And that's something that as we communicate more with one another, we can co-promote the strengths of the broader region, and that also hopefully makes us work closer together. That's wonderful news. And you're right. A lot of it is just developing an identity. And that's what we in Greater Baltimore have not done a particularly good job of. There's a lot of inferiority complex, if you want to call it, in terms of the two regions. I mean, the D.C. region is the D.C. region. It's the seat of the government. But as we keep saying, you and I, it's only 35 miles. Yeah, right. It's not that much. It's a distance that should easily be traversed in terms of economic development. Well, this is another good start, Michelle. We're going to get the word out to a whole bunch of people that we can educate a little bit about Baltimore, the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore. And I want to thank you for coming on BioTalk today. 
we'll get the word out and talk about all the good things that you're doing down there in the greater Baltimore region. Terrific. And thank you for the opportunity to be a sponsor for your October 19th Biocapital Region Caucus. We're looking forward to that as well. Well, thanks for the promo. What Michelle <laughs> is the Biohealth Capital Region Forum. It's going to be virtual October 19th. There's no cost to attend. EAGB is one of our sponsors. Thank you very much for that. And then also on the 20th and 21st, we have the Biocapital Region Investment Conference, which will also be virtual. So two things to bring additional attention to this broader regional focus that we're talking about, Michelle. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 